it's a vast subject when we consider symbols in scripture because really scripture is just full of symbology uh, from beginning to end so all that we want to do really is just we could call it an introduction to symbols in scripture because we're obviously not going to look at the subject in its entirety we've just read Genesis chapter 1 and in that chapter as we say there the, the seeds of the whole message of scripture are contained in that chapter some of it as we shall see by symbol you see God knows the end from the beginning it wasn't a case of well God set things in motion and you know when, when we got to uh, part well on the road he perhaps thought I'd better change things a bit here because it's not going quite right it wasn't like that at all that's the way that we would do it isn't it but God knows the end from the beginning as we read here in Isaiah 46 I am God and there is none else I am God there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure majestic words are they not but so true as well as we intimated just a few seconds ago we couldn't speak like that could we but God is the almighty creator of heaven and earth and so he can we're reading the same prophecy the Lord of hosts hath purposed and who shall disannul it if God says something or if God wants to do something there is no one no one that can prevent it from happening Jeremiah puts it this way he hath made the earth by his power he hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion when he uttereth his voice there is a multitude of waters in the heavens and he causeth the vapors of the, to ascend from the ends of the earth he maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures that's the way that God is and then the prophet says but every man is brutish the word means unreceptive not prepared to listen to what God has to say in his word and Jeremiah's thinking specifically about those who who worship false gods images every founder is confounded by the graven image for his molten image is falsehood and there is no breath in them they are vanity and the work of errors in the time of their visitation they shall perish and we of course have idols as well much more sophisticated than the idols that they had in Old Testament times but nevertheless they are there God says through Jeremiah they are vanity they are the work of errors and they will perish so we come to Genesis chapter 1 I don't know whether you realize as we went through that chapter all the different things which are mentioned in that chapter are used as symbols in the rest of Scripture and that list of course is not complete is it but it gives us an idea so here it is Genesis chapter 1 the seedbed of the scripture and so often by using symbol in the rest of scripture we can see how that this chapter is indeed God's blueprint as it were for his creation so we read in chapter 1 and verse 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth no mention of things evolving here is there God created he created man in his own image he didn't allow him to evolve from the monkeys as 
the so-called scientists would have us believe. And so in that first verse of scripture, we've got what God did. And of course, there's a principle here, which we see right at the very first chapter of scripture. We call it here the principle of revelation. This is the way God reveals things. So in verse 1, he tells us what he did. He created the heaven and the earth. And then, of course, in the rest of the chapter, he tells us very briefly how he did that. Day 1, day 2, day 3, and so on. And that is a principle that we see all the way through Scripture. So we say verse 1, expanded in the rest of Scripture. And then we see, if we look at that verse, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, and male and female created he them. And that is expanded again in chapter 2. And so it goes on. So it's not a case of, well, we've got two different records of creation here at all. Uh, as some would say, it's an expansion that we get. And that's the way that it operates all the way through Scripture. And then, of course, it's expanded further in relation to, we call it here the spiritual creation. The real creation. This is what God intended from the very beginning. It's almost as though the creation that we see around us at the moment is just a stepping stone to, to the real thing. And that's what we need to remember. This life is just a stepping stone, really. It's a time of preparation for God's real creation to be seen in the earth. Seen, of course, centred in the Lord Jesus Christ. There in the Psalms, let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom thou madest strong for thyself in the battle against sin and death. Or as Peter puts it there in the New Testament, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, even before God founded the world. But he was manifest in these last times for you. So let's just think about this. It's all the way through Scripture, really. See, God revealed his purpose through promises that he made. First of all, in Eden, and then, of course, the promise that he made to Abraham, and then we've got it on the screen, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. There's the basis of God's promises to Abraham. But then as we go through the chapters following, chapter 13, chapter 15, chapter 17, chapter 22, the whole thing is expanded again. And so God tells Abraham, more details of the promises that he's made to him. So we've got the physical creation that we're all aware of, that we see around us, that we are part of, and then of course there's the spiritual creation as well. We've read in chapter 1 of Genesis how that it was when the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. The power of God hovered over the face of the waters and God spoke. And he said, let there be light. Before God spoke, there was only darkness, as the chapter reveals. And so it is in the spiritual creation. Paul tells us, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God's new creation centred in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just turn to 1 Peter, shall we? 1 Peter chapter 1. And see what Peter has to say there about this, this new creation. 1 Peter chapter 1 and at verse 23. He says we need to be born again. Not of corruptible seed, as we are at the moment, 
but of incorruptible. By the word of God, the same word that said in the beginning, let there be light. And so God is working for his new creation, his spiritual creation. And it's by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass. There's a symbol. Peter doesn't mean that we are literally grass, does he? But he's making a comparison between grass and the glory of man. All the glory of man is as the flower of grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. And that's what the Bible's all about, the word of God being preached so that we might be part of his new creation, his spiritual creation. And so we read, didn't we, in chapter 1 of Genesis and verse 4, God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. But he didn't divide it the way that we've shown it on the screen there. Twenty shades of grey in the middle. That, of course, is the way that, that we might want to divide something up. You know, let, let's try and blur the edges. But that wasn't the way that God saw it at all. That's the way God divided the light from the darkness. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Oh, God can see in the darkness, but he's not in the darkness. And it's the same apostle that tells us this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved you see the problem that some people have with the word of God is it shows them up and, and we're included surely it shows us up for what we are doesn't it because it is the word of God and so that's why God made a division right in the beginning between light and darkness John tells us he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God and so of course what we have to do as we come to the word of God it shows us up for what we are it shows us how we need to change our lives so that we might be part of God's new creation we can ignore it of course sadly as many people do because they don't like what it says Jeremiah puts it this way thus saith the Lord stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak all unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house all the words that I command thee to speak unto them diminish not a word you see every word of God is important it was no use Jeremiah just saying to the people the, the bits that they like to hear he had to diminish not one word tell them all of it tell them that unless they repented that they were going to be destroyed as a nation and so they were Jeremiah of course was not like for that at all in fact they tried to put him to death on at least one occasion but we read in Jeremiah God says to him therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them but they won't listen Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years and the majority of the nation did not listen. Oh, there were a few, there's always a remnant that listened, but the majority didn't. And so we read in the same chapter there, therefore pray not for this people. This is God speaking to the prophet, don't pray for my chosen people of Israel. Neither lift up 
a cry nor prayer for them. Neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. You see, there's the separation between light and darkness. The nation as a whole had chosen darkness. And God was in the light. God's not going to go into the dark. It's, it's up to uh, humans to come from the darkness into the light. And that's what God is continually asking us to do. So when we think about this, light and darkness, it's a theme that runs all the way through Scripture. We're going to run through this fairly quickly, actually, because we don't have time to look at all these passages. Um, I'll give you a note of them later on if you want. Light is likened to the Word of God. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And being in darkness is being without the word of God. As Isaiah says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You see, the light of God's word gives understanding and wisdom. Psalm 119 again. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It gives understanding to the simple. Let's turn to Daniel, shall we? Daniel chapter 2. Because here, of course, Daniel speaks about the wisdom that comes from God and from his word. Daniel chapter 2 and at verse 20, we read, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. There's a, a, a description of God and light and darkness. God can do anything and everything. You see, the opposite is, of course, darkness. Foolishness. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 tells us, I saw that wisdom excels folly as far as light excelleth darkness. A wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness, Solomon says. See, the word of God shows us what is right and what is wrong. Psalm 89 Blessed is the people that knows the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. They will walk in the light, the psalm says. And we already looked at those words in John chapter 3. You see, the darkness conceals the lie. You get away with doing things wrong in the dark. We all know that, don't we? And that's why thieves operate in the dark. So, the word of God, the light of God's word is truth and it's good. Uh, Psalm 43 and verse 3. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth, let them lead thee, let them bring me to thy, to thy holy hill. And Psalm 100 verse 5. The Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. The qualities, the character of our God. The opposite, of course, is recorded for it in the Proverbs. Those who walk in darkness. We read in Proverbs 2 and verse 11, to be kept from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. 
who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. See, it's opposites each time, isn't it? There's a blessing for those who walk in the light. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. But with those who walk in darkness, there's only cursing, really. Isaiah says, Woe to them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. You see, with the light of God's word, there is mercy and there is grace, but not so in the darkness. Psalm 11, sorry, Psalm 112 and at verse 4. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion, but not so with those who are in the darkness. Isaiah 29 speaks about those who seek to hide their ways. It's, the prophet says, Woe to them that seek to hide their ways, that work in the dark. And of course, with the light of God's word, there is life. Psalm 36, For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. The more we read the light of God's word, the more we shall see that light. And the opposite once again. There we've got death. Recorded for us in Jeremiah 13. Give glory to the Lord your God before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. While ye look for light, only turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. So there was just a few examples of the symbols of light and darkness introduced for us in Genesis chapter 1. Here's the next division in Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be a firmament, an expanse, we call it atmosphere, in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters the which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So it's the next division. God made an expanse and there was water above the expanse and there was water below the expanse. And as we go through scripture, we find out what they represent. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. And we know why the sea's like that, don't we? It's when the wind blows on it. And it, 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 it's teaching, really. It's when false teaching comes in, and you know, man's teaching, I suppose we could say, and it, and it whips up the nations in the same way that the sea is tossed, as we see it in that photograph. See, I think the sea symbolises the Gentile nations, whereas the land symbolises the nation of Israel. If we just turn to Isaiah 43, and at verse 1, Isaiah says there, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And we've got two symbols in, in that verse 2. 
well at least two we've got the waters and God said they will be scattered amongst the nations and God says when you walk through the waters I will be with you and it speaks about the fire as well the flame a symbol of God's judgments to correct the nation I will correct thee in measure said God said to the nation of Israel how about that for a visual aid the triumphing of the wicked is short the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment see that spray reaching right up to heaven as it were for a moment we know what's going to happen don't we it's just going to fall straight back into the water again and it, it, it's such a, a marvellous visual aid when we start looking at, at God's creation we see lots of things like that which remind us of what life is all about and then of course there's the waters above speaking of the clouds behold he cometh with clouds we read in the last book of the Bible he being the Lord Jesus Christ he comes with the clouds the clouds of heaven Paul talks about them here wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us and so when we look to the clouds we can remember that that's God's purpose with those who would listen to his word we'll say more about that in the, the, the next session in two weeks time so back in Genesis 1 again the physical creation was seven literal days there's no doubt about it really when we start looking at the Bible seven literal days just turn to Exodus chapter 20 and at verse 9 six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work but the seventh day is the sabbath of rest unto the Lord thy God in it thou shalt do no work thou nor thy son nor thy daughter thy manservant thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor any strangers within thy gates you work six days but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and then verse 11 tells us why that is for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it and so the purpose of the seventh day is so that people might rest and be refreshed whether it's we humans or whether it's the animals or even the land has to rest every seventh cycle we are told in the law and it was because God made heaven and earth in six days and rested on the seventh and so we think of the spiritual creation just turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and at verse 24 that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness so we begin to see what this new creation is all about just flick back to chapter 2 of Ephesians and at verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them so this is how we become part of the new creation, the spiritual creation. Just turn over to the book of Colossians. Just two or three books on, really. Colossians and chapter 1. 
and at verse 15, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature that is in God's new creation. Jesus is the firstborn. He was the firstborn from the dead. He was the first fruits, and the main harvest was to follow. Verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. And some think this is talking about the literal creation. This is talking about Genesis chapter one. But it's not, is it? It's talking about God's new creation of which Jesus is the firstborn. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And this spiritual creation has been, what so far, 6,000 years in the preparing. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three and at verse eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why it's been such a long, long time from the days of creation, from the days of Genesis 1. God is long suffering. He waits and he waits and he waits. He's so patient, waiting for people to turn to him, to acknowledge his word. But the day will come when the Sabbath rest will be here. So we say here that the substance of the spiritual creation has been revealed by promise. For 6,000 years now, God has been making promises about his new creation, about his spiritual creation. And of course, it's all about faith. Do we believe what God promises or do we not? And it's not a blind faith, is it? When we look around us, we can see that God is indeed, is in creation. Is at work amongst the nations. And so Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 and verse 8 we read there. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. You see, Abraham was promised everlasting inheritance on the earth. But it's the New Testament that tells us he never got enough to, uh, much to set his foot on it. The only place that he owned was a burying place for his wife. But God promised him that land. And he's looked round the land but he was, he, he was a sojourner. He was, he was a nomad, we might say, at that time. But he believed what God had promised. Verse 10 says, He looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So he, he was prepared to wait, even as God is prepared to wait, for the time when all things will be made new. Just drop down to verse 24 of that chapter. We read there that by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And humanly speaking, we say, what a fool. He was in line for the throne of Egypt. 
He turned his back on all that because he knew that there was something far, far better what God had promised. It says at verse 26, He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect to the recompense of the reward. So it's all about faith again, whether or not we believe in the things that God has promised. So, there we've got, what, 6,000 years or 7,000 into the millennium of rest. It was in the first millennium that God made a promise to Eve about the one that should come. It was in the next millennium that God made a promise to Noah about not destroying the earth with water again. It was in the next millennium that God made a promise to Abraham and also at the end of that millennium to David. And going into what the fourth millennium, that's when David's seed sat on the throne in Jerusalem. And then we come to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about promises. The promises were confirmed in the Lord Jesus Christ. What did John say? The true light has now come. And they witnessed that. Sadly, the faithless majority in our days, what in the sixth millennium, reject God's promises. And we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. You might say they've always rejected God's promises. But in a very real way, in, in modern times, they've rejected God's promises. But of course, we know that they will be fulfilled. And there we've got a little thumbnail sketch, as it were, of God's purposes, revealed through promises during that period of 6,000 years. And the 7,000th year, we'll see the fulfilment of those promises. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. We said, didn't we, in the first millennium, when God said, let there be light, that's when the promise of Eden was given, that the true light would come into the world. Only promise at this time, but those who lived at that time and were faithful, believed. What did God say? Abram rejoiced to see my day, he saw it and was glad. He saw it with the eye of faith. In the second millennium, that's, sorry, the, the waters were divided, and then we've got the promises to Noah. Second day, second millennium. Third day was when the dry land appeared. Interesting. There's another hint there that the land symbolizes Israel because it was in the third millennium that the nation of Israel appeared and Abram was given promises about inheritance in the land. When we come to the fourth day, that's when the sun and the moon were created to rule the day and the night. The promises have been given to David, and it's in that fourth millennium that the kings did reign from Jerusalem. Sadly, many of them were not good, and eventually the kingdom was brought to a temporary end. It's in day five that God blessed his creation and it's in the fifth millennium that the promises were confirmed in Christ and so we can see a, a, a link here we're not saying this is this is um, based on scripture itself but we're just looking at the the way in which God has revealed his plan and his purpose first of all in the days of creation and then as we go through the, the, the millennia of time. And so we said, didn't we, that day six was when man was created. The sixth millennium has seen man reject God's promises in a very real way. Never has there been so much evidence brought to light to prove that there is a God. And it's used to prove that there isn't a God. It's amazing, isn't it? 
See, during that millennium, the man of sin was so dominant over the nations. It was during that millennium that humanism came to light. It had been under the surface, but it came to light. And now they say, well, man can do everything. We don't need God anymore. All you need to do is to have faith in man, the ability of man. And so in these ways, we live in days like never before, days in which God has been rejected outright. Let's just look at a couple of quotes. Humanist Manifesto 2, they say, the next century can and should be the humanistic century. We have virtually conquered the planet, explored the moon, overcome the natural limits of travel and communications. We stand at the dawn of a new age, ready to move further into space and perhaps inhabit other planets. That's all pie in the sky really, is it not? But that's what they believe. They believe that, yes, they can do these things. Here's another quote from a religious humanist. He's a minister, a Unitarian minister. He talks about faith in action, not faith in God, faith in man. He says humanism teaches that it is immoral to wait for God to act for us. We must act to stop the wars and crimes and the brutality of this and future ages. We have the powers of a remarkable kind. We have a high degree of freedom in choosing what we will do. Humanism tells us that whatever our philosophy of the universe may be, ultimately the responsibility for the kind of world in which we live rests with us. And we know that that is not true. And scripture tells us that that is not true. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps at all. And so we say in this very real way, God has been rejected. Everything that is promised has been rejected outright by modern man. But we do know that day seven will appear. God will act to bring his kingdom to restore his kingdom to the earth again in that millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. He said, didn't he, in the days of Noah, my spirit shall not always strive with man, and so it will not. Read the Hebrews. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labour, therefore, to enter into that rest. When it talks about a rest, it's not talking about getting your deck chairs out and having a rest like that at all. It's a rest from trying to overcome the impulses of the flesh and all the evils that we see in the world around us. That's what the rest is about, and it will be working for God in a very real way. Just as we try and draw our thoughts to a conclusion, let's go back to the promises to Abram. We don't have time to look at these passages, but Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us that Abram's descendants will be as the dust of the earth. Genesis 15 verse 5 tells us they will be as the stars of heaven. And Genesis 22 tells us they will be as the stars of heaven and the sand on the seashore. See, symbols. Now, we know what dust symbolises. Symbolises mortality, doesn't it? We know what the stars of heaven speak about as well. But what's this business about the sand on the seashore that is mentioned? Before we look at that, let's go back to Genesis 16 and just con contrast the promise that was given to Hagar. No symbology there. Genesis 16 and at verse 10. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. End of story. No symbols there. 
So what is this symbol about the sand on the seashore? And here we see, we've got to see what the real sand does, what, what the literal sand does to start with. Read those words in Jeremiah chapter 5. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for a bound of the sea by perpetual decree that it cannot pass it. Though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. They can't get over the sand, Jeremiah says there. Strange this, isn't it? We hear that beaches are the most unlikely of landforms to be found facing the open sea. They are, after all, merely piles of loose sand or shingle, and yet they manage to remain intact on coastlines where the waves can reduce concrete seawall to rubble in a very short time. And here we see the difference between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. Stop the waves, concrete wall. Waves knock it flat. But the sand keeps the waves in check. Read these words in Job. Who shut up the sea and break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud ways be stayed. And we know that the sea represents the nations. God controls the nations. He decides how far they can go. And we look at that photograph there of the waves on the sea. And the sand can keep the waves in check. When you begin to think about it, it's quite simple really. There's energy in those waves as they come up the beach. And the energy is absorbed by the sand. You see, the wave takes some of the sand with it up the beach. And as the wave withdraws, so the sand is constantly moving backwards and forwards up and down the beach. God's way of controlling the sea. You see, man didn't think about that, did he? Read those words in Deuteronomy. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. What's this to do with Israel, this is? God uses Israel to control the rest of the nations. And he will do it in a very real way when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. The prophets tell us that Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Speaking about the nation of Israel. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I met thy horn iron, I will met thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. And so we see what the symbology is telling us. You see, in the coming age, the nation of Israel will fulfill that role. So if you come back to the promises, dust of the earth, many of Abraham's descendants have lived and they've returned to the dust of the earth because they had no faith in what God promised as the stars of heaven. This is interesting because they were promised that they will be as the stars of heaven. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, shall we? And chapter one. Deuteronomy chapter one and at verse 10. Moses says to the nation, The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. Just drop down to chapter 2 and at verse 25. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee 
and the fear of thee upon the nations which are under the whole heaven. Here they are. There's the stars of heaven. And God puts their fear and dread unto the nations that are below them, who shall hear the report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. Because God is with them. But we know that that was conditional, wasn't it? If we just go to chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, and at verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this is a great nation, it is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who has God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? So had Israel as a whole listened to God's law, put it into practice, this is what would have happened. But we note, we noted, didn't we? God said to them at verse 6, Keep these statutes and do them. And we know that sadly they didn't, as a nation, do that. Just turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's that well-known chapter which speaks about the blessings and the cursings that would come upon Israel depending on whether they obeyed God or disobeyed God. Verse 13. We're in the blessings here. The Lord God shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only. Thou shalt not be beneath if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God which I command thee this day. To observe and to do them. And so we come into the section which deals with the curses. Verse 43. Here's one of the curses. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. And thou shalt come down very low. That's if they disobeyed God. And they did. And eventually we know, of course, that Israel was subject to the nations, to the likes of Babylon and later on Rome, because they didn't listen to what God had said. And so, although they were promised initially that they could be as the stars of heaven, they forfeited that role. And... We don't have time to turn to it, but it's in Matthew 21 where Jesus speaks to the rulers of Israel and he says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And so what we have, of course, in that last promise, the stars of heaven and the sand on the seashore, we've got a cameo of the kingdom. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ ruling with the saints as the stars of heaven. Daniel said, didn't he, in chapter 12, speaking about the resurrection. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And so just as we conclude... These are the words of Jesus. He that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. That's the promise. If we overcome and keep his works to the end. You see, God's not put the world to come under the subjection of the angels, as we read there in Hebrews chapter 2. He's reserved that for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, his followers. And so we read in Revelation 20, I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither received his mark in their foreheads nor in their hands. 
and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They refused to acquiesce to the false teachings of that Roman system and many of them lost their lives because of that. But here we read, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. See, that's when God's new creation will be a reality in the earth. No longer a matter of promises, the promises will be fulfilled. And we pray, do we not, that we might be amongst that number who can overcome to live and to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ.